Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Angel R. Talk, and today I am speaking with a former colleague. This this one's interesting because this is a, a person I actually worked with down when I was in uh, Wall Street who is running for public office now. The city of New York, Boricua from the Bronx. <laughs> Tamara, please introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. What, what your background is, what you're running for, because he, I, I have to be entirely honest, I don't know all the political positions in, in the city. I, and I think most people will think it's uh, uh, president, Congress, Senate, governor, mayor, and they don't care about any of the other ones. But the truth of the matter is that those are the ones, those lower positions on the state and city level are the ones who affect us more directly. Yeah. So please uh, yeah. tell us, share with us, please. Yeah. Well, they all actually affect us. Even even things on the federal level affect. Of course, us. of course, um, of course. This is certainly a lot more, a lot more local. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Tamara Lashtrek, and I am running for New York State Assembly in New York's District 66, which includes uh, East Village, West Village, Soho, and Tribeca. Um, my background is, um, has been 26 years in financial services. I worked in various different roles, um, which is how I know Angel. Um, I left Wall Street last year in order to pursue other opportunities, uh, which is, which includes a starting a business, a career coaching business. So I am now an entrepreneur and building a coaching business. And what was interesting was last year I won, um, I was nominated for the Woman of Wall Street Award and I got seated next to a woman who was running for Congress. And we spoke about politics all night long. And I told her, you know, some ideas and visions that I had for our federal government. And by the end of the evening, she encouraged me to run for Congress. And she had given me her card and said she could introduce me to, you know, the necessary people to get that launched. I decided that it wasn't a good time for me because I was focusing on building my own business. And so we kind of put a pin in it, although I've, I've always been very interested in politics and could always envision myself having a political future. Um, then in October, I was having dinner randomly at a restaurant in Midtown and ran into the same woman and had asked her if she remembered me. And she said she did and said, hey, we're having a donor dinner and let me introduce you to some, um, some political players in the New York scene. And so I met them, we just briefly chatted, you know, just like you would meet somebody at a cocktail party, you don't really think too much of it. And they took some of my information down. And in January, they reached back out to me and asked me to run for Congress. Um, so they brought me in and interviewed me, asked me some of my political views and were very impressed with both my background and my knowledge about uh, government and you know, said that they wanted to endorse me. But again, it wasn't the right time for me because I was still really much building my business. So I turned them down and they came back to me and asked me if I would run for state assembly. And that seemed a lot more doable that I could set up my business in a way where my time is spent minimally on my business and much more focus is placed on, on this role in state assembly. So I felt like it was a very good um, opportunity because it would also give me an entree into politics and I would learn how to run a political campaign. And then I could decide whether or not I want to pursue, uh, which is, <laughs> pursue a career in, in, in an area that seems like it is quite a shit show. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you're, you're, you're running as a Republican in New York city. What, what's that like? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I have been a Republican since I was 18 years old and I'm, I'm a very moderate Republican as, um, I'm a very what does that what does that mean? Like what what does like moderate Republican like can you explain that for someone who most of the people that are going to listen to me are are going to be Democrats, right? right? And they're automatically going to think that you're 
uh, a certain type of uh, person with certain type of views just because you have Republican. But yeah. you say moderate Republican. Can you explain that to them so that they understand what we're? Yeah. I mean, it generally means that our, the policies that I support aren't really extreme um, to the right. So um, my, my main issue with being a Republican is I believe in fiscal conservatism. Although the Republican Party over the last, I would say, decade or so hasn't really displayed much fiscal conservatism. Now on social issues, I am pretty liberal, which again pulls me sort of towards the middle. And I would venture mm. to say that I have more in common with moderate Democrats than Democrats or Republicans have of the wings of either of our parties. So our views mm. are just not really extreme. They're very, they're very close to center, which is where most of the country really falls into. So, um, but going back to what I was saying, so I've been a Republican since I was 18 years old. And, mm. you know, it only, only recently has become toxic to become a Republican. Now, there are things that the Republican Party has done that I, that I don't necessarily support. And rather than jumping ship, I do plan on bringing reform to the Republican Party. I do think that the Republican Party needs to modernize. I think that there's, you know, an issue that's near and dear to my heart is has been women's issues, which were some of the topic that I, topics that I discussed with this woman who is running for Congress and really urged her to bring a new, more female-focused agenda to Congress because I think that while you know the economy is an issue that everybody cares about there are issues that are spe specific to women that the party hasn't really done a good job with addressing so i would like to bring some of those issues into into if i were to run for congress i would like to bring some of those issues into government um so yes so in terms of what's that like and what's that about i mean most people who meet me and know me know that i'm very fair and balanced and I am open to hear perspectives from anybody, quite honestly. And I, I'm not so dug in to every one of my beliefs and have always been, you know, very empathetic and have always been able to sort of see both sides of every argument. And, you know, some of the laws that we have in place don't really apply necessarily to the way life really works today. So where they need amending and updating, I'm very open to, to hear everybody's perspective. You say you want to get New York on its feet. I was looking through your website and I saw that often being referenced. So how does, it, how does that actually happen? First of all, the role of the state assembly is not unlike uh, Congress, but, but at the state level. So what the, what the state assembly does is it, it le legislates and writes laws. It um, also does have some influence over, over budgeting as well. Um, so qu quite honestly, the way they function together, um, you know, it does, make, it does make making an impact challenging. Um, because there are certain things that you're responsible for as an assembly person or as, as um, you know, the state assembly is responsible for, and sometimes it might not have the direct influence. Now, that being said, I've already been working with, you know, business owners and restaurant owners and talking to them about a plan. What, um, what I would like to do when I win is take the needs that businesses have and bring them to the floor and see if whether, you know, see if we can get legislation passed in order to help support these businesses so they don't go under and that they could rebuild and once again thrive. Now that's going to be challenging because you see what they're up against and there's going to be a lot of businesses, there are already a lot of businesses that have, have closed down never to reopen again. You know, right. so we have to really, we have to really also um, try to incentivize new businesses to come in but in order to do so, we want to make sure that our, our laws are business friendly. And it is challenging to do business in New York. It's a very expensive city. And the condition that it's in now, you know, arguably, you're not getting any real bang for your buck. So 
it doesn't really behoove businesses to necessarily move move to New York. So you have to really be creative with how you incentivize. Um, there also has to be some laws, you know, some liability, some business liability laws that give protection to businesses. Um, you know, we're a very lawsuit, you know, lawsuit happy society. And mm -hmm. you can't have people walking into a restaurant thinking that they might have gotten COVID there, or, you know, maybe at, they got it at a store next door that they popped into, or they went to a friend's house that might have had COVID, not really be able to accurately trace where they've gotten COVID, and then they go and they sue the restaurant. I mean, we can't really have that. I mean, that's just going to really be detrimental to our local economy, and it's just going to put undue strain on, on businesses. So it also seems very unfair because you don't know where you, you really could have, you could have got COVID right in the train. You could have, uh, you could be the one spreading it. Uh, you know, that just, it just seems uh, unfair. It, it, it's with such an unknown thing, you know, it's not like if I'm standing in a restaurant and I slip and fall, it is unquestionable that I was hurt at your restaurant because you didn't put up a sign that says wet floor or whatever. That's a very clear cut, very simple thing. Whereas COVID is this invisible, invisible thing that can be anywhere. Um, just seems unfair. I, I'm, I'm inclined to uh, agree with that. You know, just, just seems like it would be unreasonable to, to be able to, I, I, first of all, I don't even know how they would prove that. How do you prove that? How do you prove that you didn't already? And, 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 and I don't mean to sound insensitive or, or attack anyone who's gotten sick. Obviously, that's clearly not the intent. But if you're trying to blame it on someone and financially benefit from that, you know, um, uh, even on, aside from a business level, you can, you can meet me tomorrow for lunch, get sick and say, I made you sick. And yeah. sue me. It's that, that's, that's, but, but you're correct. We live in a very, people can sue you for anything. <laughs> you know, yeah. They can sue you for everything. So that's, that's, that's kind of, kind of rough. Remember, do you remember a few years back or many years back now where the woman, um, the woman came, went to McDonald's and she had that scalding hot cup of hot <sighs> coffee that she put between her legs and then oh. and it spilled and she got burned. I, mean, I do remember, but, but the, the, the didn't she that, win that though? I think she won it. Yes, I, I kind of feel like she won that lawsuit, and then they made different changes to try to address that. But uh, I do think she did win it. I do think she did. She won that. That's lawsuit. that's that's sure a tough one because. But mm. anyway, we do need protection for our small businesses, but I wouldn't necessarily extend that same protection to major corporations. For example, um, I would be weary about, you know, the large hotel chains. Um, and the reason I would be weary and skeptical about, um, about them in particular is, look, you and I both worked for corporations and we know mm -hmm. how corporations tend to cut corners and they need to, you know, make sure that they are not cutting corners and that they remain compliant. And if they have that protection, they are likely to abuse it. So I would be very, right. very, I wouldn't be supportive of extending that to corporations. And I would be, if it, if it were extended to corporations, I would be very vigil about the monitoring of that. Um, but I do think for small, for small businesses, for sure. Yeah, it does. It does make sense. I, I, I've been to hotels in the past where, uh, oh, as a matter of well, no, I don't want, I don't want to name anything. I don't want to do anything. I've been to a location on a trip um, during COVID, and there was used soap left over in the room. There was hair on the toilet. Okay, and I don't know what that was, but let's just say it was hair on the toilet hair in the bathtub and used products, toiletries. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it looked to me like this bathroom wasn't cleaned. Now, if there's hair in there, like shaved hair, I don't know where it comes from, hair on the toilet, on the bathtub and use soap. Clearly 
this room wasn't cleaned. Yeah. If I can visually see these items, then imagine what I can't see. You know, so my, I called them up and they said, okay, we're going to come and clean the bathroom. I said, no, no, no. I want you guys to clean this whole damn room as if it wasn't cleaned. And I'm going to hang out while you guys do it. I, I apologize if I sound rude, but oh no, we changed the sheets. Well, how do I know that? Yeah. You didn't, you didn't even clean the toilet and you let me see it. It wasn't even like an attempt to mask it. So if, if that's happening, um, I, I don't know if they have protections or not, but imagine, imagine if you protect them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that, that would be yeah. just, I couldn't believe it. And this was during COVID. Oh, this really? was during wow. COVID. Wow. This is why it blew my mind. I called them and they were nonchalant about it. Yeah. Oh, we'll send somebody to clean it. I said, you guys understand what I'm saying to you? You know, um, and I, I generally, I expose things like that um, on, my, on my blog and on my platforms. I, I didn't do it because I'm trying to be uh, more of a good person and helping people improve, but they got to do better, you know? Yeah. Getting New York on its feet, right? One thing I've noticed back on, also connected to COVID, is that since COVID happened, I feel like New York City is starting to feel more like it did in the 80s. I, I will uh, attribute that to our, our, I will call our fearless leader <laughs> in, 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 uh, in the mayoral position. But do, do, would you agree with that? And what, what so would, you're, talking would about, you're talking about before Giuliani took over? Correct. I'm talking yeah. about, yeah, so, so even it, it, Giuliani right now to me is kind of crazy. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to, 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 to speak much on that guy um, up to date. But one thing I will say that I, I believe that anybody who's honest, right, mm -hmm. is honest and truly uh, speaks reality would acknowledge that we, I, we had Koch, we had Dinkings. During that period, New York City was crazy. Yeah. Then we got Giuliani. And again, I, I, I am not advocating for the guy. I know he did things that may not have been great for uh, communities of color, um, where I grew up and in, in, in the poor neighborhoods and stuff. But despite that, it must be acknowledged, if you are honest, that when Giuliani came in, crime went down. The gangs started to hide. The shootings became less. New York City got cleaned up. Um, it, it just can't be denied. No one can deny that. Um, I have a, a hard time reconciling that because I, I feel like there were things that were done that hurt our communities that maybe shouldn't have been done. Um, fathers were taken away from families that maybe didn't have to be. Um, but a lot of those people that they did take away had to be taken away. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even simply walking the street as a kid, I grew up in the South Bronx mm -hmm. and this was when I was a teenager um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, during the eighties and early nineties before Giuliani came in, the, the streets were wild. There were gangs everywhere. I would see them with the colors on. Um, there, there's no discretion. They were out there. We're hanging out. I'm not going to say any names because again, I'm not, I'm not looking to get stabbed or shot, but they were out there. Giuliani came in, now they started to be discreet. Mm -hmm. They were still around. I still knew some of them. Hey, what's up, brother? You know, but they were being discreet. Things changed. There was a clear change. Times Square changed. Obviously, I mean, we, there was a time where our joke would be, you know, your mother works in 42nd Street. Yeah. And that didn't mean that she worked at Disney. It meant she had yeah. a different career. That was our childhood diss to our friends your mom works at 42nd street and it had an entirely different media oh well, actually she does she works at the disney store uh, yeah. that's not yeah. what that's not what we meant when we said it back then he changed that you know um when bloomberg came in i feel like we were kind of just maintaining maintaining the status quo i didn't feel that things got horrible things were getting worse and then this guy comes in and all of a sudden I feel like we're backtracking. We're not quite there just yet, we're, but we're I feel not, like we're backtracking. We're not 
not we're not quite there, but um, I grew up in New York. I, I think I'm a little bit older than you. I grew up in New York in the '70s, and I we used to live in the East Village, and it was it was utterly <clears throat> it was unsafe. I, I mean, I remember walking out, um, walking into our lobby of our building. We lived in a tenement building, and there were a lot of homeless people sleeping in that lobby. And wow. they were urinating and defecating literally in front of me. And, you know, I was, I was a little girl and I remember my mother, <laughs> my mother was not a very aggressive or assertive woman, um, but she was pretty horrified and she would sometimes yell at them. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're doing this in front of my daughter. My daughter's a child. Like, what is wrong with you? And um, I remember, I oh. distinctly remember, you know, those memories having to step over homeless people that are sleeping in our, in our lobby. Um, and it was, like wow. said, it was unsafe. And then when we had moved to New Jersey, you know, our, our, my entire family continued to live in the East Village. So we would always come into the city and spend time with them and, and have holidays with them. And I used to come into the city all the time as a teenager as well. And anytime you would, you would drive into the city, I knew where to park which was always by the police station on 5th Street. But if you didn't park on 5th Street, um, you could guarantee that your car would get broken into. And this is, I mean, we knew the drill. You wouldn't leave anything in the car. You couldn't mm. leave something in the seat, on the front seat of the car and then park it and then take it out and put it in the trunk because you would be seen putting it in the trunk and then your trunk would get broken into. You'd literally have to clean your car before coming into the city, making sure there was nothing, there was nothing visible. They would break into your car for a dime. Like if there was a dime on the seat, it would get broken into. It was wow. really, truly unbelievable. And then you'd be able, you'd be able to buy the things that were stolen from you on Second Avenue. Okay. I, so at four o'clock in the morning when you're coming, <laughs> coming in from the bar. You know, I remember my ex-husband had his car broken into and they stole a tennis racket and literally the tennis racket was getting, was being sold there. So I do remember <laughs> if the city were as safe as it was under Giuliani and Bloomberg. I don't know that my parents would have left the city. I think mm. that they would have probably raised us in the city, but it was, it was too unsafe. So, you know, we moved to, um, we actually moved to a suburb in Newark and, um, you know, but I, I did return to New York City because of the work that Giuliani and Bloomberg Bloomberg had done. Now I've read books on on Giuliani. I, I tend to agree with you in terms of you know him. I and I, I would I would disagree with you on you said he's become a little crazy. I think he's always had that in him, <laughs> that little bit of oh, crazy. Mm. Because again, growing I was up too young back then to really. I didn't I didn't really follow. Um, any political stuff and and um i I can only remember the the change I felt on the street, and it was during that era, so I referenced him then, so i didn 't see him speak back then, I never saw anything I only see him now, and he looks yeah. like he 's wacky now <laughs> no, yeah and i didn 't see him speak back then, but what i what I will reference is um you know growing up as a teenager under his administration. I, you know, always believed New York was a free frontier. So, you know, there was times where you would come and you'd be hanging out with your friends sort of on a stoop somewhere drinking beer in a bag and police would come up to you and they would confiscate it and they would pour it out in front of you and things like that. So I felt like his, I felt like those policies were a little bit extreme, but this was from a perspective of a young rebellious teenager who, you know, wanted to come to the city to party. Um, and he's been fringing on, you know, fringing on my party. Now, as I got older and I saw how well he did in terms of cleaning up the city, I started to get very curious and I did read a few books on what he did and how he did it. And another thing is, you know, driving into the city, you know, you would get, you know, you, you would get uh, the window washers um, that would come up to your car and, and they would right. spit on your car and they would, um, you know, use a dirty rag to wash your car and stuff. And at times they, they got a little bit aggressive too. And, you know, one of the things I remember that <laughs> did was he took them off the street and when he, when he started arresting them, he started to see that they had pretty long rap, rap sheets. And when he started to arrest people for misdemeanors, he would see that they would have 
you know, much more of a rap sheet than just, you know, hopping the turnstiles. So by him taking a hard stance on some of the misdemeanors, he actually was able to capture a lot of the felonies and the violent felons as well. Um, so um, yeah, and as for and as for some of the social issues that you, you raise, you know, I mean, you know, right or wrong, I just think it's very difficult to go back and judge judge by today's standards. You know, I mean, we're seeing that all over the country in terms of, you know, tearing down our statues, you know, for good or bad, this is our history and re revising it and scrubbing it. Right. What is, what is no. truly the benefit of that? You know? I, I don't, I, I don't agree in revising it. Um, I, I believe we should know it. Um, I, I feel like those statues would be better served in a museum where people can still go and see them and see the historical context rather than maybe uh, out in, in people's faces where maybe it's a community that, that was ill-treated by this person. And, the, you know, it, it all depends on the, the specifics. Like, I don't know all the, all the statues throughout the United States, but I certainly don't believe in changing the history. I don't, I don't think we should, I mean, if, if we're judging people what, by what they said in the past, I think most of us, including myself, could, could, be, uh, could all be devastated based on some of the things. Well, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not just you. I mean, this is one thing, you know, in my, in my coaching business and what my coaching business has, has taught me, and just because I have, I'm a new coach, I've been sort of in this coaching space for many, many, many years. And one of the things that we learn is about the imperfections of human beings. And we teach people to embrace their imperfections. And you, you know, if you're religious, God, you know, God loves you exactly the way you are. And it's, it's, you know, nature in itself is imperfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, but on this, on this political side and social side, we're trying to hold people to an unrealistic right. standard. Okay, we're all imperfect. We all say, say stupid shit at one time or another. Okay, right. you know, trying to sterilize us, it, it's, it's, it's not realistic. And it's not a world I want to live in. Like, I'd like people, people, their people evolve. Their, their imper imperfection. Yeah. People evolve, people change, you know? We're all striving to be better, but trying to be perfect, again, is, is, is a philosophy that my, what I teach in my coaching, I am opposed. I mean, we have so many insecurities and hangups from, from parents telling us, oh, you know, we didn't do this well, or somebody criticizing and all this stuff. And then I, as a coach, try to work to reprogram people and eliminate this emotional baggage and mental baggage that holds them back from them getting what they truly want. And then we have this society right now that is trying to blame people for anything that they do wrong and the imperfections. And I find the two, for me, conflict with my core values. You know, I'm going to do the best job I can. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Have I said right. stupid shit in the past? Absolutely. Okay. But, you know, I do the best that I can. I always strive to be the best. But if I fall down, I'm okay with it. And it's taken me a very long time and a lot of work to say that I'm okay with it. Because as somebody who worked on Wall Street, I chased that perfection, okay? Mm -hmm. And it did a disservice to my psyche, okay? Always feeling that you're never, you're never good enough. You're never good enough. Constantly chasing something that is unattainable, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is the same concept. What they're chasing and what they're driving is unattainable, okay? We all need to love each other exactly the way, of, the way we are, okay? Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, okay? We're all people and we all fundamentally want the same things. We want a roof over our heads. We want to feel safe in our homes and in our communities. And we want the opportunity to be able to thrive. You know, we're, we're a culture that is built on innovation and industry. And we all put a great amount of value on our careers. And, you know, what is going on in New York City with, with all this upheaval and unrest 
and preventing preventing us from going to work, from building businesses. I mean, this is really against the, the core beliefs of this country. So we need to bring that back and we need to in, install uh, representatives and an administration that is going to support those values. I mean, well, well, a lot, a lot of the things that are going on, the, I, I feel like a problem is that people are unwilling to to reason with each other. Like, for instance, right, I am not anti-police. I support the police. However, we have to be able to be honest and say that some of those cops do bad things. You know, um, the problem is that a lot of people are 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 entirely against them or entirely for them and they cannot come to this consensus and say you know a lot of the cops i know a lot of police officers i have officers in my family good people they're not bad people you know but i grew up in the what we'll call the ghetto right and i encountered cops that were were what we would call bad apples you know, um, use use racial slurs when talking to me, use racial slurs when talking about my friends, you know, um, and even something as simple as hopping the turnstile. You mentioned, you know, somebody hopping the turnstile. I got caught doing that um, in the middle of a gang fight and I was with a few friends. I, because of how I look, was treated differently than my friends who looked different than me. So that there is a bias too that individuals have, um, or blatant racism in some cases. And in this particular police officer, seeing as though he called my friend the N word and he called me the S word, <laughs> you know, clearly this guy was probably falls into the racist camp. I'm just gonna venture a guess, you know, <laughs> that he falls into the racist camp. But he was a cop, and he had at that point the authority to determine whether or not my hopping the turnstile was a ticket or had me in handcuffs or if he was going to shoot me or if he was going to beat the crap out of me. I was at his, um, I was at his complete control. Took me into this little room where nobody can see anything. And I, I was very respectful. I cooperated, um, which I generally advise people to do, but I know that there are times that you can't. For instance, if somebody has a knee on your neck, your instinct is to fight to get them off. Doesn't matter what's happening, your instinct to survive or somebody's punching you in the head. You know? And again, we're not saying all cops do this, right? I'm just talking about these uh, situations where somebody says, well, you should comply. Well, if you're punching me in the head and you say, you know, put your hands behind you, comply, comply, and you're punching me in the head. No, my instinct is to do this. Yeah. You know, um, just it's a survival instinct. And, and then things happen, right? Um, so I believe that there are problems, right? Um, I support Black Lives Matter. I support that movement. Um, I, I believe there is a problem in society. Um, when people talk to me, like, oh, they'll say, well, more white people are killed by police officers. I, I don't know stats. I don't have, you know, and I don't trust them all that much. But let's, for the sake of, of, of debate, let's say yes. Okay, it's true. More white people are killed by police officers. Uh, then, then we are agreeing that there is a problem. We are agreeing that there is a problem. That police officer shouldn't kill a person if there's no immediate threat or whatever. So, and again, not all cops. I'm not attacking all cops. I'm just speaking in, in terms of those bad apples, right? If we can all agree that there are bad apples and you say, well, the bad apples are killing white people. And this guy says the bad apples are killing black people. This guy says the bad apples are killing Latinos. Why don't we all then agree and say, let's get rid of those bad apples, including the police officers, because that's part of the problem that they can't say anything about the bad apple because if they're in a bad situation, then they don't have that protection afforded to them. I'm all over the place right now. I'm I'm sorry. I'm bouncing because I'm trying to I'm trying to explain the point and and it's it's hard. It's a hard point to make because I understand both sides. Yeah. And that's always a, a issue trying to say I understand that we have a I, I believe the majority of officers are good officers and we have those few bad officers that make it real bad for those good cops. Yeah. They make they make life difficult. 
Yeah, you know? and I think I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think that majority of the cops are good, okay? But then you have this, you know, you have you have this extreme cases and it gets put on video and broadcast to the world. Look, that should have never happened. And those cops are gonna have their day in court and um, you know, they are going to be, you know, judged by a jury and they're gonna get their due. Um, and you have to trust you have to trust that the the legal system will handle it. Now, the way our society and our systems have gotten so corrupt, you can't really trust it. <laughs> quite honestly, well, um, we wouldn't even we wouldn't even know about it if there wasn't video. And if there wasn't video, even with the video, there was no action until people started marching and and going into an uproar. That's the problem. Every person should have been able to say that was wrong. But we, you yeah, know, didn't. I, I've never heard one person say that it wasn't wrong. I think that uh, this is something that our country unanimously agreed on. I've never heard one person that said that what happened to George uh, Floyd was I okay. could, I could tell you I of many. Never. He was on drugs. He was going to die anyway. He was but already Martin, dying. This is this. Those, those, those may be true facts, but he still did not deserve, deserve to die this way. It, regardless no. of what the situation is, he did not right. die like that. And I did not hear, I have not heard anybody disagree with that. So if you did, you know. Oh, I have plenty, that. plenty of people. I could tell I, you all the I, points I they've made. One. I haven't it's, heard one. But going back to the point, the point is that, yes, there's bad. Yes, there are bad cops too. I think majority of them are good. A very small percentage are bad. But you have bad in every industry. I mean, look, we worked on Wall Street. Not everybody in Wall Street's bad. Okay, not everybody in Wall right. Street broke the law. Okay, so you know there's bad, there's bad, there's bad teachers, there's bad, there's bad um, doctors. Chris, I mean, Chris there's Rock. crazy doctors who kill their patients. I mean, Chris, Chris Rock bad wrote, everywhere. Yeah, so in that in that capacity, like there's industries where you can't have bad apples, and that's a bit that Chris Rock says. Like you can't have a bad apple pilot that just doesn't want to land the plane. Listen, you know. This is, but this is why you have this is why you have processes and policies and training in order to try to weed out those bad apples. But you don't right. always catch them. And you know, look, you again, none of these issues are none of these all of these issues are complex. I mean, of then course. you have you have the unions that protect them. So right. you know, do you vote to get rid of the unions or do you need union reform? I mean, then you have unions that protect bad teachers. So, I mean, right. again, back to the union. Rubber rooms, right? You have the rubber rooms for the teacher to, to hang out when they, they don't do their job. They, they hang them, they send them to, to a rubber room while still paying them. Now, I don't know if this policy still exists, but um, it used to be that if you were a bad teacher, they would just send you to this room where y'all just hanging out, doing nothing and getting paid the teacher salary because they couldn't fire them. I think it was called the rubber room. I, I covered it years ago. Um, you know, but that's the thing with the police officers that if you got that bad apple or that bad um, officer, a lot of the time they still protect them. The unions protect them. Um, other officers that could speak up and say, hey, and, and granted, in this scenario with George Floyd, people spoke up. Officers spoke up, which yeah. I had never seen. I had never seen um, a, a significant number of officers actually speak up. And I thought that that was, that's progress. That they, everybody can, like you said, the majority of people, and especially officers, to see them speak up was good. And, you know, and this brings us to community policing, right? This is something I think can help if the officers know the people, if the officers see the people, if they, if they have relationships with the people, we can all at that point, you know, get along better. If, yeah. if, if, if the cop that comes to my door because of a, a noise complaint or whatever is an officer I know, hey, you want some water? You know, you, you, you will have a, a relationship with them. And I don't know how we do that in a big city. It's not like it's a small town, you know, where it's so much easier to do, but they actually, there actually is a there actually is a program called um, Build a Block, which um, which has some officers that are assigned, and then they have these sort of community meetings, and they're actually not very well attended by the community. So I don't know if it's a thing of COVID or people are just not interested. 
Um, but who, the, the question would be, would, who are those officers? Are those officers a part of the community? Are those officers somebody who commute from Long Island who don't know the community? Well, if, you know, these, I, I, I think it's a good, uh, it's, it's an attempt, which is good, making an attempt, you know. Yeah. Um, but right now, the division between law enforcement and people is so... Uh, I agree. There needs to be more bridge building. But the thing is that, um, the thing is that, um, you know, a lot of officers can't afford to live in the districts that they police and patrol, okay? So I know that, you know, my district has a particularly high rent. Mm. I can't imagine somebody on a police officer's salary being able to afford to live in the district. So, you know, what, you want to have rich communities that are extremely expensive? So what, no, no police for them? Or what? Like, I mean... <laughs> You know, they just need to, you know, they just need to, you know, do a better job of, of community outreach. Um, and, you know, there are officers in my neighborhood that I know, but I'm a very different kind of person. I know my neighbors. I actually had a birthday party um, a couple of years ago, actually last year, and my neighbor lent me his house. Okay. Oh. I texted him and was like, hey, can I use your house for my, for my, you know, for my birthday party? And I wasn't really great friends with this neighbor necessarily, but mm. you know, he, he actually- They wanted want a cake. <laughs> they wanted some cake and actually, chips. <laughs> he actually was away for the entire month. So he wasn't even oh. at my party. But I mean, this is the kind of relationships that I've built with my neighbors. Um, I have right. you know, people that, that work in the neighborhood. I know the restaurant owners. Um, you know, we, we all have each other's back in terms of, you know, um, when I used to, when I used to have a, a job that I went to and if UPS delivered something, they would leave it at the store next door. You know, these right. are the kind of relationships, but I remember, <laughs> I remember when I was telling my colleagues at, you know, our, our previous firm that I was right. going to ask my neighbor if I could use my, use his house for my birthday party. And they thought I was insane. They're like, he's not going to lend you his house. That's crazy. That's, that's how I, that's how I lost my virginity. My neighbor lent me her, her apartment. <laughs> I was, well, there you go. See, the kid, you really know, community. The community. <laughs> <laughs> she let me in place. I've always been grateful to her for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but the reality is New York is a city where people don't really know their neighbors. And right. everybody is, is just, you hey, know, On that point, on that mom. point that you just said, I had a woman carrying me and my son uh, a couple of days ago, right downstairs. She carried us. She came up to me. She said, who are you? Where are you from? And why are you here? And I looked at her and I thought about whipping out my phone. I thought about putting her on the internet and becoming famous and destroying this woman's life. Right. And, and, and then I thought to myself, let me make it a teachable moment. And I just looked at her and she said, I asked you a question. Where are you from and why are you here? And I looked at her and I said, really? Seriously? You, you're doing this right now? And she said, yes, yeah, seriously. And I, and I kind of stopped and I said, let me ask you a question. We're in a relatively isolated area. Are you armed? She said, no. Do you have a knife? She said, no. What if I were to go over to you right now and grab you by the neck and choke you? What are you going to do? And she just went pale. I said, I am not threatening you. I am not going to do that. But you might want to consider your personal safety before you approach two men in a potentially unsafe place. That's the first thing I want to offer to you as, a, as your neighbor, because I live in this building and I'm waiting for my wife and her elderly mother to help them bring up some groceries. That's why I'm here. But the way you just approached me was very hostile, very nasty, very aggressive. You don't know me. I'm wearing a mask. I'm not worried about that camera there. If I were a bad guy like you thought I was, I could hurt you. Why would you do that? Yeah. She said, oh, my God, that wasn't smart of me, was it? I was like, no, it was very reckless of you. And in addition to that, I could take out my phone right now, film you, and put you on the Internet as one of the Karens gone wild, and you will never get a job again. And she, just, she was just in shock. She's like, did I just do that? Was I just... You know, did I have a moment like that? I was like, the way you spoke to us was very aggressive. 
you know, very hostile. Like I felt, look, I showed him my hand. My hand was shaking because my adrenaline was up, yeah. you know, and rather than trying to hurt her or, 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 or destroy her reputation or anything, I, I took, I took, I took a more um, a gentle approach and, and tried to uh, educate her on why not just say, Hey guys, how's it going? You guys need help or, or just a different approach that isn't who the hell are you and why are you here? I don't owe you an explanation. I'm in the building somehow. Right. And, and this is one of my neighbors who I never met. <laughs> you know, like you said, you go to meet all your neighbors. Everyone I see, I say hi to. If, if she would have walked by, I, said, I would have said good morning to her, but she didn't. She came and she attacked us because she didn't recognize us. Yeah. You know, and that, that I, I chose to make it a teachable moment. One, you don't know who you're approaching. I am not a bad guy. Neither is my son. But what if I were? What if I were? What would you do? I said, what could you do? Can you stop me? If I try to, and she said, I, I, you're a pretty big guy. You look strong. I don't think so. Why would you approach me in a dark place like this? Call the cops. Go ask the doorman if he knows who I am. Say hi, but stay by the door. You know, no, she came to where we were at and, and was very, and she told me she was angry. She had been stressed. I was like, I understand all that. And clearly I'm not trying to cause you trouble because I'm not filming you. I thought about it. I really thought about it because you, you could make me viral in, in, in the internet and that would help my brand. So I really thought about it, but I'm not that kind of a person. I'd rather talk to you and make a friend. Mm -hmm. And after that, we spent like two hours. I, I kid you not. We spent about two hours down there talking, just talking about everything and anything. Um, and we got friendly. Yeah. But, you know, we could have bypassed all that me explaining all the scenarios of her getting choked, of her ending up on the internet, because you don't know what you're getting into. Why would you do that? And plus, it's not like we were doing anything wrong. We were just standing there waiting for, yeah. for our, you know, our family. It's just bizarre. Um, some people, just, just bizarre. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of very angry people and, you know, um, again, in coaching, we always say hurt people hurt, um, right. you know, people right. that, you know, just, you know, are haters, they've got a lot of pain and, you know, for, I mean, I know, you know, this economic climate has re really triggered a lot of their pain and it's, it's really unfortunate, um, because there's a lot of hurt people that are walking around and it's, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. I mean, I think we all need to be kinder to one another. So um, that is what, that is how I try to live. You know, I try to be courteous to my neighbors. I try to, I try to always, you know, smile and say hello. And I really try to be very positive. Now, one thing that really helps me in order to get into that state is I don't watch any news. I mm. stopped watching news four months ago and literally it's like being um, out of Free. a it, free it, it, yeah you, you're free there's a sense of freedom um there's you know i i cannot believe the amount of propaganda that that um our media is manufacturing and i don't care what news you watch it's all of them so mm -hmm. um that's always been a problem and and they're very polarized they've gone from at some point in our life reporting the facts to giving opinion yeah it's no yeah. longer facts they're, and they're, they're propagating a narrative and yeah. and both know, sides do it. I, absolutely. you can watch the same story on both sides and, and see completely different, different, uh, different presentations yeah. of the same exact story. Absolutely. Tamara, it, it has been a, a pleasure chatting with you. I, I appreciate you coming on, on the podcast. Would you like to um, give any closing thoughts, any, any, um, how people can donate to your campaign, how people can find you. And um, yeah, I, that, would be, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, I have a website. It's Tamara4ny.com. Uh, they can donate directly to the website. Um, and there's a way to contact me on the site as well. And Angel, I would like to thank you for having me on your podcast. It was wonderful to see you. I know that it's been years. 
I mean, I remember yeah. um, not only did we work together, but you also helped me set up my first blog when I first started writing. So, Painting the canvas. Yeah. It's still out there. It's still out there. <laughs> I don't really write on it, but, you know, one day I may go back to it when, when, when the dust settles. Um, right. Got a lot going on right now. Started, and that's what got me the writing practice um, that I needed in order to write the book I wrote. So um, we've known each other for quite some time. And again, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for, you know, listening with both ears. I know you're, you're a Democrat um, and I'm a Republican, but we've always res been respectful to one another. And, um, you know, maybe that'll become a teachable moment and, you know, we can lead right. by example because Again, I don't want everybody to think like me because that is how you get the great, the greatest, um, the greatest diversity of thought is how you get the greatest innovation. So I mm. want people to think differently, but I do want to be respected for my opinions. So, um, and I will, and I will do the same for others. So, thank you, um, thank you for your hospitality on this call. It's been wonderful. Of course, my pleasure. Good luck on the on the campaign trail. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You are listening to the NYC Talking Podcast. We are NYC Talking, the realest lifestyle blog ever. Please follow Angel R Talk on Twitter and Instagram. Please like NYC Talking on Facebook. www.nyctalking.com. Thanks for listening.